Hi everyone, in this video I'm going to discuss how I prepare the top painted layer for my watercolor paper pendants. This is a finished watercolor paper pendant, but when people actually see it and hold it, they have not a clue what it's made out of. They think it's some type of baked ceramic material. It's very hard, it's very durable, and the paper has become totally transformed into something that looks totally different from paper. The reason why I call it a watercolor paper pendant are basically two reasons. The first reason is the pendant is constructed entirely from watercolor paper. It's created by using a method that involves layer and paper to build the initial form. Then the top layer, the layer that you see here, is a small watercolor abstraction that has been glued to the finished layered form. And this pendant has the added detail of a crystal right over there. The pendant itself floats on its cord, thus eliminating the need for extra hardware. And in my opinion, extra hardware such as jump rings attached to the end would take away from the elegance of the design. One of the most important steps in preparing to create the watercolor paper pendant, and I have a few laid out over here at various stages of development, is to actually prepare the watercolor paper. Here are some pieces that I've cut out in preparation for more pendants like this. And here's the sheet that I cut them out from. In this short video, you'll watch me develop this abstract watercolor painting that'll be used for raw material to create my pendants. This will become the top layer of the pendant. And before I jump into the actual painting process, let's talk about the tools and paints that we're gonna need. For my paints, which I already have dispensed in these little plastic containers. It's a great way to keep them clean and separated from one another so they don't mix. When I'm actually painting, I mix my colors on palettes like this. But for the abstract watercolor, no need to use a palette. This is fine. Now the colors. What colors do I use? I stick with the primary colors and variations on the primary colors, meaning that, for example, my blues, I have a variety of blues here. I have cerulean blue, I have French ultramarine blue, I have cobalt blue, and in the corner over here you see thalocyanine or Windsor blue. For my greens, looks like I have a lot of greens on the palette. All of these greens are mixed. This is a mixture of cobalt blue and Windsor yellow, and this is a slightly darker mixture of cobalt blue and Windsor yellow, and this deep green that we see over here is mixed with French ultramarine blue and Windsor yellow. And speaking about the yellows, I use two kinds of yellows primarily. My Windsor yellow and Oriolan yellow. For reds, I have a variety of reds. Quinacridone magenta is one of my favorite colors. Windsor red is a much more spectrum color-like red. Cadmium scarlet, intense, brilliant red. And we could throw the browns into the red category very easily. Brown matter, a deep reddish brown. And another one of my favorite colors, burnt sienna. So we have our reds, yellows, and blues. Some of these other colors that we see here have been mixed. And occasionally, I do like to use diazazine violet. I buy that as a tube color. And I have something over here called green gold. It's another tube color. The only green I buy is a tube color. In this video demonstration, my primary brush was a number six, series seven, round, sable, Winsor Newton watercolor paintbrush. You don't have to use that one. You can use a less expensive brush. To wet the paper, I also used a large, flat Da Vinci paintbrush. To dampen my paints, I like to use these squeeze bottles very effective way of dispensing water to keep your paints moist. Towards the end of the video, when I was finished applying all the paint, I did sprinkle in a little bit of regular table salt to create certain kind of effects. 
And I painted on a piece of Arches 140 pound cold press watercolor paper. And of course you need a container and this definitely needs to be cleaned out now. A container for cleaning your paintbrush. One final item, a board that I've varnished many times now that I use as a painting surface to lay my paper on as I'm developing the abstract painting. So my colors have been lightly moistened and they're ready to go. The paper. What I like to do with the paper is wet both sides. Why do I wet both sides? I wet both sides because if you simply wet one side, the fibers will expand on that side and the paper will eventually warp. If I wet both sides, the dampened paper will lay flat. Make sure it has a good amount of moisture in it. Now often I like to start with a phthalo blue. I'm going to go with Windsor blue, which is a phthalo cyanide blue. Flow it in. Short little staccato brush strokes. This preparatory step requires lots of clean water because you're going to dirty your water very quick. See? I'm not going to attempt to blend my colors. I want them to, to blend naturally. Let me, let me advise you uh, with your cleaning water, maybe it's good to have two of these buckets of water. This way you have a, a wash where you really get out the bulk of the paint and then you go to a rinse and your, your brush will be much cleaner that way. Hey, I have a little green gold. I normally stick to my primary colors, but it's sitting here, so why not? I do like to get contrasts thrown in there, so I'm gonna get a little neutral tint, a real deep, dark, blackish color. I love it. Gonna go back into my Windsor Blue. A little bit of Windsor Red. See, I'm relying not on a brushing technique, but on a splattering technique. Let's see what happens if we add a little cerulean blue, which is a slightly more opaque, skyish blue color. Yeah, I want to get a nice concentration of pigment. Not too watery. If it's watery, the colors will look anemic. Weak. You don't want that. I have a mixed green here that I'm going to use a combination of cobalt and Windsor Yellow. My water remains clean. I keep on running over to the sink and dumping out the dirty water. Good. Oh, yeah, I like what happened with that. Throw a little burnt sienna into the mix. Some cobalt blue. Once I change my brush stroke a little, I'm still not blending. That's the danger to blend. I could use a stroke to apply the color, but I'm not blending it. I want everything to run and flow on its own. I have a mixture of cobalt and quinacridone magenta that gives a really nice violet. So get yourself an assortment of colors and have fun with them. And definitely use good colors. I like Winsor Newton watercolors. I think they're beautiful pigments.
with the cheaper brands of paint, what happens is you get a lot of filler and a lot less pigment. With the uh, more expensive artist quality brands of paint, the pigment concentrations are much purer. Brown matter, spelt M-A-D-D-E-R. A very deep, rich, reddish brown. Rinser yellow again. The temptation is to get in there and start playing with it. Do not do that. You'll ruin your, your beautiful abstraction. And notice, my main approach is to continue to go back and forth to complementary colors and position them next to one another. Hey, a streak of neutral tint may give me an unexpected dark area that I can use. In fact, let's get some very deep darks in there. I'm going to paint the whole area with the neutral tint yeah because i'm liking this approach where i have a dark surface so how do you do that with the remaining paper i'll make it dark with the neutral tint then i'll take my windsor blue and throw it in go to quinacridone magenta throw that in A little cadmium scarlet. Well, that'll be interesting because this is a very dense pigment, a granular pigment that will, a lot of it will disappear, but I will get flicks of this color. I have to say that was fun. And what I am going to do when it reaches a certain level of dryness, it's still too sopping wet. When it gets to a point where a lot of the standing water has dried, I'm going to sprinkle some salt into it just to create that unique salt effect that occurs when watercolor interacts with the salt. Here we go. This is what I'm talking about. This effect over here. See, I can tell there's way too much water there, but this area looks perfect. So let's sprinkle a little salt into there. We'll see what happens. Don't go dumping it on crazy. You notice how I just sprinkle a little so the actual grains of salt remain distinctly individual. They don't all merge into just a pile of salt. I'm going to throw some more down here. I think I want to get a little cerulean in there. Why cerulean? It's opaque. And it'll stand out. Just little drips like that. Tomorrow we'll sit by the sea. Good. The day pass. Time to leave it alone. There will be no Come back later. Words only limit the breeze. It is later. And, and the watercolor paper has completely dried, and now I can start to use it to build pieces. Although I began this video demonstration with a discussion about building a watercolor paper pendant, the technique that I demonstrated to create this abstract painted watercolor surface is the same technique I use in all my watercolor paper jewelry. It's a necklace that consists of watercolor paper and wire, and the paper inserts were created in exactly the same way that I demonstrated over here. Here's a pair of earrings using that technique. A work in progress that I think I'm gonna finish up real soon. Here's a completed watercolor paper pendant. My 
a bracelet using that technique? The bracelet is hinged, so it's able to be put on someone's wrist by opening it, and then it slowly closes, making it easy to wear and not fall off. Another type of bracelet that I construct using the watercolor paper technique and it clasps in the back like that. I hope you enjoyed my demonstration on how to prepare the watercolor paper for watercolor paper jewelry.